So I'm going to introduce now our second guest, um, Dr. Ryan Flynn is going to give a speech about his excellent research, a discovery and functional interrogation or, uh, of SARS-CoV-2 RNA host protein interaction. Uh, I want to share some background information about him. He is currently an ass assistant professor in the stem cell program at Boston Children's Hospital and in the Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology at, Har uh, at Harvard University. Uh, he completed his undergrad work at MIT, moving to Stanford for his MD and PhD training, and most recently finished his postdoc work in the laboratory of Caroline Bertozzi, also at uh, Stanford University. Uh, also, we have an information that Ryan has touched a living Komodo dragon. It sounds quite scary and uh, interesting, but I definitely want to hear uh, your experience at the end of your talk. So, okay. Right. There we go. Now I'm unmuted. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Uh, great to be here. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm just going to reshare my screen here. Um, should be all we good now. Um, we can't see very well. Great. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm happy to be here, and uh, I can I can talk to you about that like after I guess um, it was it was not very uh, long, but it was an interesting experience. Um, but I think uh, you know more relevant to the to the topic today, I wanted to share a bit of our work on SARS-CoV-2 and and what the what the RNA genome is doing and and how it how it sees the the host cell, the human cell, and and what this what the human cell sees. So uh, Felix had a nice slide like this um, in his introduction, and I'm not going to go through all the steps, but I think the point that I want to get across from this is that when viruses, RNA viruses, DNA viruses, when they infect our cells, there are a huge number of steps that uh, are all required and uh, mostly hijack host pathways. And there are things where viral, there, there are processes where viral proteins are important, where the viral RNA is important, where they both operate and they can, you know, enable new bio, biochemistry or new, new functional pathways, or they can disrupt, you know, existing and endogenous pathways. But when people think about these processes and things that get hijacked, there's a, a, a tendency to focus on the protein side of things. Um, what host proteins are changing, what are the protein factors that are being made by the virus, how is the, you know, capsid and the, the, the virion actually forming, and you try to go through this whole, whole process. But, you know, it turns out that, uh, you know, the, the, the genome of these, of these viruses are quite important. They hold all this information, and they're not inert um, molecules. They're, they, they are themselves biopolymers that look like endogenous biopolymers. And so in the context of RNA viruses, you know, the virus is injecting these, you know, KB long, you know, of course, we talked just in the, in the previous talk about how long the, the SARS-CoV-2 viruses were almost 30 KB. So they're these enormous pieces of RNA that have structure, that have binding sites that can adopt, you know, bind small molecules and, and in general, the, the understanding of where the virus RNA goes and who it interacts with and what it does from the, from the sort of perspective of the RNA is not as well understood. So that's kind of where um, sort of my work in the past and some of the work that we're doing now has centered on. And we like to ask, you know, what is this interaction from, again, this RNA-centric perspective? And so to do that, we, we uh, use this, we use this platform called Chirp Mass Spec. And it's just like any IP or any enrichment protocol, but rather than using an antibody, which is commonly used for protein-centric tools and, and techniques, we're using oligonucleotides. So on the left, the sort of schematic that we're showing is, you know, we can take, in this case, we took SARS-CoV-2, but we've done this for dengue, for Zika, for rhinovirus. Um, and we're working on we're working on other viruses now, but we can take this and we infected or not infected uh, two different cell types, so human and monkey cells, 
And we, af you know, after infection, we cross-linked them with a, a chemical cross-linker. And that's really important because what that does is um, it fixes the endogenous um, or sort of like quote in vivo um, interactions between anything that is happening. So RNA protein, RNA, 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 DNA, protein, DNA, anything that's going on, you make a mesh around different molecules. And then what we can do is selectively isolate the things that we want. And so because we're interested here in the viral interactome, the viral RNA interactome, we can use tiling oligos that go across the entire uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome and pull out uh, with you know, biotin magnetic, uh, uh, biotin strobavidin beads and, and enrich for the viral RNA specifically. And then the, the, the question is, what do you wanna do with that? And you could do RNA sequencing, you could do DNA sequencing, but we're gonna focus today on the proteomics, the, the, you know, which proteins were physically associated with the viral RNA. So we can get a perspective on what were the complexes, the host pathways that were being hijacked or inter, you know, interfaced with the, with the viral RNA during infection. So we always do these controls up front because it's really important to know if uh, what you're going to dis quote, discover in the actual experiment is going to be relevant. And so the first thing that we do is try to leverage existing knowledge, if, if there is any in the, in the field, and think about what viral proteins, you know, we're putting the virus in, it should be expressing proteins from itself. And many of these may actually bind, are known to bind the genome to help regulate the genome structure or translation or other things. And so sort of from the five prime to three prime end here, uh, from left to right, we're looking at uh, a bar plot at the top of the different um, uh, viral proteins that we recovered that were associated with its own genome. So uh, for example, all the way on the right, we get a lot of enrichment. So the y-axis is enriched protein, the enriched polypeptide. Um, so we get a lot of the end protein uh, when we pull down the viral RNA, and that makes kind of a lot of sense. And if you walk through, I won't go through the details here, but if you walk through a lot of these other bars, it was kind of interesting because we could see that there were many cases where we could actually see enrichment of RNA binding proteins that are encoded in the viral genome, but other cases we didn't see that. So for example, in you know, NSP1 uh, was, was fairly weakly associated with the viral RNA um, in both cell types that we looked at. But that made sense to us in the context of a lot of other work that had been going on while we were doing these experiments because NSP1 seems to go to the ribosome and is really focused on a host RNA binding and not viral RNA binding. So with this sort of data, we felt pretty comfortable that our CHIRP was actually working. And so we sort of steered our eye away from the viral encoded proteins and asked what were the host encoded proteins that we could actually recover and, and you know, what do they look like and, and what types of proteins were they? And so to kind of visualize the whole set at once, um, we, we make these uh, interaction networks where the, every line is a known interaction. And so we're defining this middle sort of like spoke around the wheel of SARS-CoV-2 with our CHIRP data. But then the other interconnections are, are known protein-protein interactions between these, between these host factors. And what I just want you to sort of appreciate is that it's not only RNA binding proteins. So the RNA binding proteins are sort of on the top, the, the top, uh, you know, bar of, of these things. We have, you know, the HNRP proteins and RNA helicases and, and SR proteins, but there are a number of other, what are otherwise not canonically thought of as RNA binding proteins that eventually, as, you know, uh, associate with, in a very specific way, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, -CoV genome. And these are, things like metabolic enzymes, cytoskeletal enzyme, uh, proteins, um, even intracellular uh, vesicular transport was very interesting to us given what we saw for other, um, other uh, virus, virus chirps that we've done. And one kind of interesting detail that we were able to establish with this technique was doing this at two different time points. And so we actually uh, performed the chirp mass spec at 24 hours or 48 hours post-infection. So it's not a perfect time course because things become a bit heterogeneous as the cells are dividing differently and getting infected differently, but it served as a sort of earlier and later infection stage uh, uh, sort of inter interaction 
interaction profile for us. And this is the same network that I just showed in the previous slide, but rather than just being colored by intensity, so the, you know, the, the amount that we were recovering, it's actually colored by when we start seeing them be associated. And so what sort of, uh, the, the, so the way, the, the way to look at this is if, if you see something in um, red, it means it was associated early and stayed associated for the late time point. If it's in blue, it was associated early and then stopped being associated. And if it's in uh, like orange or, or yellow, um, it was only associated in the late stage. And I think the, the cool thing for us was that it kind of made sense the way this, this data uh, sort of sussed out because the RNA binding proteins actually come on early and stay on. So as if they're being, they're, they're the sort of recognition platform that the host cell uses to interrogate and start to think about what is this viral RNA inside the cell. And then once they're on, then these other kind of accessory uh, factors and pathways that are these metabolic enzymes and the cytoskeletal skeletal network, then they can come and associate and perform potentially some function. But there's this sort of um, molecular logic that occurs between earlier and later infections and how the cell actually associates with the, with the factors. So, you know, this is an interesting, uh, we think this is an interesting sort of way to look at the data, but it's kind of hard if you've not seen any other chirp data um, or uh, other chirp and viruses or, or endogenous uh, RNAs to have any appreciation for whether this is specific or interesting or not. And so what we ended up doing was we took our SARS-CoV-2 data and compared it to the other viruses I just mentioned. So we had a number of other positive strand uh, positive, you know, orientation, single-stranded RNA viruses, including dengue, Zika, and rhinovirus. And we, we uh, sort of started to look around the cell in these different um, uh, functional categories that we thought would be very interesting uh, and potentially revealing in terms of specificity for how different viruses would actually hijack in different patterns the host networks. So, this is kind of a zoomed out image of the figure that we made. And, and uh, it's, it's kind of too big and too detailed to go into the whole thing, but I just want to highlight a few things. And so, um, like I mentioned, there were these early factors that bound SARS-CoV-2 and that these are the, what we think are generally canonical, just, you know, your, your very vanilla RNA binding proteins, with, which just bind every RNA in the cell. And what we saw was that across, um, here, so in the next couple of things, the, all the columns are the different viruses, the viral chirps, and then the rows are going to be different genes. And so with yellow being the most enriched in this context, we saw that um, the, the HNRPs were reasonably homogeneously bound to all of the different viruses, kind of didn't matter if you were a virus and you get infected in a cell, the cell binds you with these, with these factors. But it was very different uh, when we looked at different compartments of the cell. And so, you know, despite many of these, uh, for, you know, the, the Flavia and the, the Corona both needing um, uh, envelopes and, and the, the membrane components of the cell, uh, we saw really specific association with ER components and ER translation, where the Flavies were significantly more associated with uh, the translocon and the SEC complex on the ER um, and the, the, the COP1 vesicles, whereas uh, SARS and, and the rhinovirus were less associated with these. And, and I mentioned these, these vesicle, the, the cytoskeleton, cytoskeleton and the vesicles, and we saw this very uh, robust association and seemingly specific association with the sort of vesicular network um, in the SARS-CoV-2 infection and, and you know, kind of comes up in the later time point. So if you look at the first two columns, you'll see that this D1 or day one, so 24 hours, there's not much association with these factors, but after a longer period of time, the, the viral RNA has a more robust association with the, with the vesicular network um, in, the, in the human cells uh, compared to these other RNA viruses. And so this is all great and exciting in, in our view, but you know, the question is, is any of this stuff functional, right? Well, well there's an association and that's fine, but does it, does it matter to the virus? Is it actually you know, functionally important for uh, any part of viral, the viral life cycle? And so the strategy that we took uh, was to um, begin to do knockout screens where we could 
do either unbiased, so you know, genome-wide knockout screen, so every gene in the genome, or we could take some of the guides, some of the genes that we've defined as these associated proteins and target those for knockout. And so we could do a focused sort of uh, uh, pooled, pooled screen of hundreds of genes rather than you know, tens of thousands of genes. And so the idea, again, is that you'd, you'd do single gene knockouts in different cells, you'd apply the virus or not, you'd look for differential death and then sequence the cells that were surviving and uh, get, get these um, sort of volcano plots that are shown on the right where um, things that are uh, scoring well on the right side of the plot are thought to be more uh, sort of a pro-viral factor, whereas things, um, you know, on the right, uh, on the right, sorry, I was backwards. So left is left is antiviral and right is pro-viral. Um, this is a putative associate, uh, you know, um, annotation. So, you know, we have to kind of go back in one gene at a time, show how they work mechanistically, but this is kind of how they sort. And one of the things that we were really excited about was when you do look at the CRISPR genome-wide screens from SARS-CoV-2, actually many of the genes that score well in the, in the knockout screen are RNA binding proteins. They are these proteins which we find in the chirp mass spec. And so the things that were colored here are colored by their intensity and their recovery in the chirp mass spec data set that we, that we generated. And it was sort of interesting to us because there was a, a seeming bias for antiviral factors. So the density of these gene names and, and, and colored dots here on the left is a bit more than we saw in the proviral context. And, and so we, you know, we, we uh, repeated this with a mini pool, like I mentioned, with this, with this focus library. And we saw something very similar where there was an even stronger bias for antiviral factors. And when we um, overlapped the, the, the two, we could find sort of a, a, a highly validated set of these 53 factors that were you know, putative antiviral, but kept, kept coming up as really important uh, uh, you know, factors in the, in the COVID-2 uh, screens, but also associated with the, um, physically associated with the RNA in our CHIRP data sets. And so you know, we wanted to learn a little bit more about these factors and ask if this is a coronavirus specific set of factors or, or if these were general antiviral factors that cells always used for sort of like any, uh, or, or you know, to a degree, any RNA viral infection. So we you know, went back to this sort of screening uh, strategy that we had, but in, instead of expanding the gene number, we expanded the, to the total number of viral conditions that we were screening against. So we looked at other coronaviruses, we looked at the coronavirus and, and influenza, and we, we, did the same, we did the same type of screen, but again, focused only on the CHIRP mass spec um, hits. So we could do this sort of with much higher resolution and much higher quantitative sensitivity. And what we found was that of the proteins that bind the SARS-CoV-2 genome, most of those operated as antiviral factors in most of these viral infections, which we thought was kind of interesting. And again, I mentioned that there was, we saw the sort of time dependency of how RNA binding factors like binding early to the genome, and then these accessory factors come on. And so we think that in a sort of similar way, the, the you know, really robust uh, association factors seem to, to uh, be the first sort of host defense that the cells use uh, once the viral RNA gets inside the cell. And uh, you know, sort of always act to dampen to dampen the activity of these of these viruses, sort of broadly across all of these all of these types of viruses. Um, and uh, I'm going to switch conceptual gears here. I didn't highlight it earlier, but there was one really kind of interesting factor that we saw, and it was a uh, RNA methyl transferase that was locally localized to the mitochondria, and it was it was the top hit in our chirp data set. Um, so it was the strongest single factor that associated with the SARS-CoV-2 genome. And it was very strange to us, but it made us think <laughs> what's happening in the mitochondria. Why would this um, otherwise you know, localized mitochondrial factor, this RNA binding protein, ever get access to the, to the SARS-CoV-2 genome? So we ended up looking at infected cells, uh, comparing them to, to uninfected cells. And when we looked uh, under, under uh, sort of EM resolution, what we noticed was that there was a difference in the size and the sort of characteristics of the mitochondria. 
And in particular, the area of the mitochondria seemed to increase over time as cells became uh, infected. So from earlier to late stage infections, they, got, they grew larger and larger. So we, we uh, ended up uh, doing another screen to see how the mitochondria might play a role in SARS-CoV-2 infection and found again that actually the, the um, mitochondria seem broadly speaking, when you look at all of the factors that are annotated as mitochondria related, they seem to operate, this organelle seems to operate broadly speaking as an antiviral um, organelle. And it's actually much more biased compared to just the broad set of chirp mass spec, which are mostly RNA binding proteins uh, that we saw. So the, the, the mitochondria additionally seems to be this sort of antiviral hub almost that cells have, uh, have access to, to, to try to dampen or, or in other ways squash these, these RNA viral um, infections. And because of all this work, we've sort of circled back to our, our chirp mass spec data and, and produced a plot like this, which I thought was kind of interesting. You know, it, it was sort of cool that we thought we saw these, you know, that we, that we were able to visualize these differences in the, in the SARS-CoV-2 um, infection and the differences in the mitochondria, but, you know, infection is very stressful. Um, and so mitochondria, of course, are, are stress responsive. And we, we wondered whether what we were seeing was, was just like general, you know, cell stress. And that why, that was why the mitochondria were being disrupted. Or if there was something specific to this particular viral infection that was causing the mitochondria to operate in one way. And what we, what we saw, I think, to, to support that last idea is that when we looked across the viral, when we looked across the different viral chirps and we interrogated the association of mitochondrial factors, we saw super specific association patterns. So only in this like few genes here at the bottom of this circle do all the viruses associate with those factors during infection. But usually what you see are these patches of, of yellow suggesting that there are very specific um, patterns of association between a given RNA viral genome and specific mitochondrial factors. So not just broad mitochondrial stress leads to leaking of the mitochondria and associating randomly with these viral RNA genomes, but rather there's some specific logic that is undergoing, that, that's happening during these different viral infections where you get, you get particular factors associating with different, virus, different viruses um, for reasons we don't yet know, but it seems like they'd be sort of antiviral from our screening data. So I'll just uh, close here briefly and, and just highlight again that we think um, chirp mass spec is a really um, great tool to look at uh, RNA processes and from an RNA centric perspective. We think it uh, can elucidate a lot of things when you're not, when you're not uh, normally thinking about um, the RNA biology, despite the, the, all of the source of these proteins coming from the RNA. We saw a lot of virus specific associations and virus specific functional changes. And then we think there's some uh, viral specific mitochondrial logic that occurs during, during infection that um, might contribute to anti, uh, sort of antiviral immunity, some sort of innate, innate uh, response there. So um, I just want to thank uh, real, real briefly um, Julia Belk and uh, Ansu Satpathy, who uh, I worked together very closely while I was in Carolyn's lab as a postdoc and with Craig Whalen at Yale um, for all the infections that we did with SARS-CoV-2. And um, as was mentioned, I'm, I'm now starting my lab um, here at Children's Hospital in Boston and, and at Harvard. And uh, we're, we're building out our team and thinking more about RNA viruses and um, uh, also glycoRNA, uh, separate, <laughs> separate topic, but um, sort of the, the RNA world is, is uh, very interesting, I think. And that's kind of where we're gonna be, where, where we're gonna be thinking. So um, yeah, I'm happy to take questions and uh, thanks everyone for your attention. I am thank you for this wonderful presentation and it's very exciting research. Uh, so we can uh, now take uh, questions. Um, I'm checking the chat box, but I have also two questions during this time I can yeah. ask. So um, your research says provital hits are unique within virus families related to viral entry. So during the process of comparing Will it be advantageous to focus unique providers or common providers within virus families? How should we consider this point for our next step? Hmm. 
I guess it's a question. I guess I guess um, it's a question of how you wanna, how you like doing how you like doing the science, right? So I think one thing that I really like about virology in general is that you get uh, you know two answers for one. So you get information about how the virus works, but you also get information about the how the host works. Um, and so if you want to bias your answers for something that's going to be specific because you think um, there, there, you know, there's something that there's something in the, in particular in the way this works for one viral family, or there's some unique aspect of that that you want, then you can look at the specific ones. But I think the, the, you know, the way that, the way that we try to do these, these studies where we're definitely building some resources is, uh, you know, allow, <laughs> allow um, common and specific hits to, to be found. And then um, everyone, everyone's allowed to do, uh, you know, as they will uh, with, with whatever we, with whatever we have. So of course. It, it also depends on our question for our research, right? Yeah. So uh, we have also other questions in chat box. How accessible are these technologies to all the world, especially in a pandemic moment? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, so, you know, I was lucky to have done a lot of chirp mass spec before. And so it was pretty easy for me to spin up, but um, actually a, a, a key effort of, of Fung here on listed in my lab now is to, is to make it more accessible. So there've been a couple of key issues. The biggest I, I think has been that we actually need a lot of material. There are um, some, just, just some general inefficiencies that, that uh, exist in the chirp mass spec protocol. It's, it's incredibly robust. And every time I've done the, um, done the assay, it, it, it works and produces really good information, but you need a ton of cells. Uh, I mean, we we're working with, you know, usually on the order of like a gram of cell pellet, which is a lot of cell pellet, maybe, maybe a billion cells or more than a billion cells per, per assay. Um, but I don't think that's necessary. And so we're working on that, but um, conceptually it's very simple. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's again, very robust. And I think that the biggest thing is if you, if you follow the protocol, it will work. Um, the only, I actually, I actually don't have a custom protocol. I just follow the protocol that my, you know, the, the, the inventor uh, Chu and my, my PhD advisor wrote, I think it's like a 2018 methods paper, but um, it's, it's, it's just super robust. Um, I think that the biggest challenge right now in terms of accessibility, um, is material amount. And, um, so, so, you know, if, if you wanted to do an early time point, for example, of a viral infection, you might be limited because you would have not a lot of RNA to, to capture, right. Or if you could only infect one 10 centimeter plate for whatever reason, you know, you may, you may not be able to recover enough protein, but, um, we're, we're working on that. And, and I, and I hope to have sort of a, a little methods, a uh, little methods paper coming out, um, soon to, to give some of the optimized conditions we have, we have going. So, um, another question, great work. Did you observe fusion fission changes of mitochondria? How can mitochondria function as an antiviral organelle through um, RGI signaling, RGI signaling, sorry. <laughs> yeah, those are great questions. So, um, you know, we had, a, we had help uh, from, from collaborators at Yale um, who are experts in mitochondria. <laughs> I, know, I know almost nothing about mitochondria. Um, we saw a number of changes in the, in that organelle. And I think we were being cautious about how detailed we want to get into that analysis because you, it's kind of important to start to generate like mechanistic understandings of if you're saying there's a fission difference or a fusion difference, or, you know, a respiration cook, you know, when you say, when you start to provide additional granularity there. Um, it's important to show mechanistically that what you're saying is reasonable. And so there were clear differences in the mitochondria uh, size. And so we reported that, but I think more carefully examining that with different knockouts or different inhibitors of fusion or fission, for example, could be really interesting uh, to, to nail that down in the context of these different infections. 
Um, I think one other important point, and it's something that we're going to be addressing in future CHIRP experiments, is that the vast majority of stuff that we do, um, and many people do, <laughs> are in uh, rig eye deficient cells. So we did a mu much of this work in HUH 7.5 or 7.5.1 cells, which don't have uh, you know, competent innate immunity. And that's great if you want to study these, these, inter these infections because they produce a lot of viral RNA and they allow the replication to occur. But it's a bit artificial, of course, uh, when you consider what, what might be going on in a body. And so I think when we um, you, you know, so, but, but that, but that is, uh, you know, important in the context of having a maybe less optimized chirp aspect experiment, uh, technique. So, um, I think as we, as we improve the tools so we can see deeper and with better sensitivity into the, into the system, we'll move into, uh, models, um, cell models or in vivo models where innate immunity is intact or adaptive immunity is intact. And we can actually explore these, these interactions, um, maybe across time, but also in the context of an, you know, a, a competent innate immune system. So I think we're, we're working on that also, but it's, it's a caveat, I think, to think about, um, because yeah, there is no rig eye in the, in the HUH cells mm -hmm. in these, in these cells we used. Okay, thank you. So the interesting questions are coming. Uh, being a mitochondria and antiviral uh, organelle, does this imply that the metabolic state of a cell tissue uh, could lead to the control of the infection? Thinking on a more uh, glycolytic over oxidate uh, phosphorylation metabolism. Yeah, uh, we definitely think that, you know, the, the mitochondria did not look healthy. And so again, you know, the precision under which they are not healthy, the, the precise way they are not healthy was not clear to us. Um, yeah, is their respiration different? What other metabolic processes are impacted? There's a lot of other work that's come out, um, you know, discussing the sort of more metabolic or, you know, catabolic state of the cell uh, during, during SARS-CoV-2 infection. And there's a lot in other infections. Um, I think it's, you know, for us, the reason why we were excited about it is because, um, again, the, the, the mitochondria is known to respond to all sorts of stress, but we saw this apparent specificity to the, the specificity in the way things are associated with mitochondrial factors. And so our view is that, um, th this allow, this sort of allows hypotheses to be developed, to ask the questions of, is there something virus specific to uh, the way mitochondrial uh, disruption occurs in infection, or is it every virus is everything the same? And so now we have factors, you know, we have, we have, we have pathways that you can go in and ask, like, are they the same or are they different in different contexts um, with some of the, with some of the data that we've generated as, as like background. So um, I think the answer, we don't, you know, we don't know the answer, but I think it's a, it's a good hypothesis, right. To, to come away from, to come away with and, and, you know, could design a new experiment around it. So before the last question in chat box, I would just want to add, because I think this is related to this uh, last question, you found out that antiviral activities conserve across virus families. So I was wondering, could it be possible to produce a vaccine for all the respiratory virus or two or three respiratory viruses in considering common antiviral factors? Yeah, I think, um, I think our work lends itself towards um, less towards the ideas of vaccines and maybe more towards the ideas of medicines in my view. And maybe it's a, you know, a, a term difference, but I think that the factors and the pathways that we're discovering with these techniques are, um, are important once the cell has been infected and you may be able to dampen or otherwise reduce spreading of a viral infection. But I think of immunity, I think of vac vaccination and vaccines as a way to prevent the initial infection. And so I think that our data would be maybe less relevant to developing a vaccine, but maybe more relevant to developing therapeutics against maybe longer term infections, um, like, we're, like we're seeing with like long COVID um, or, or other things like that. Thank you for, for your answer. And uh, Beatable Interaction Network, are you thinking to compare those results with other members from the same family of COVID-19? 
Yes, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're, we're, we're working on that now. Yeah, um, we're very interested to see if it's purely, purely conserved across the viral um, genome family structure or if there are specific changes in the different, you know, fam across the different families. Yeah, we're super interested in that. Okay, that was uh, the last question. Uh, 